to this very special presentation by the International Affairs Forum. I'm Karen Siegel, I'm a co-chair of the forum. Three years ago, IAF brought the Academic World Quest competition to Northern Michigan as a way to engage high school students and encourage their interest in the world. Academic World Quest is a quiz bowl type of competition where teams of four students put their heads together to answer questions about a variety of subjects. NATO, Russia, trade policy, they're, they're all defined subjects for each year. Um, I'd like to have the students who won this year's competition come forward right now. You've seen them as you were coming in. And we're missing someone. Okay, all right. Well, um, I'm going to just have them just uh, tell you who they are, where they are in school right now, and if they have any special interests that, that they're pursuing. They're, um, William Chown, who is not here, is the senior who is uh, headed off to college next year, but I think everybody else is um, uh, still at school for a couple uh, years. So please, Meredith. Hi, I'm Meredith Allen. I'm a junior here at Central. Um, and my main interest, interests right now are math and science. I'm Bob DeVosa. I'm also a junior here at Central, and my main interest is engineering. I'm Nicholas Fryer. I'm also a junior here at Central, and my main interests interest are engineering and politics. Wow. Wow. All right. So, here, come stand over here so you're not right behind me. Um, so I just want to tell you a little bit about when they go to Washington, D.C. Um, they will compete against uh, 50 teams from all over the United States. And we are one of the smallest areas even sending a team. And this year, the competition itself is being held at the National Press Club. So that's a very cool place for uh, them to experience. And I think they're going to have a great time. And they also will attend a diplomatic uh, event um, the night before the competition, which this year is being sponsored by the Oman Embassy. Okay, now I have to stop right there, and in fact the students don't even know this yet, but I have to tell you a very amazing coincidence. So Oman is a relatively small, four million people state in the Middle East, relatively stable, doesn't make many headlines. So imagine my surprise when I discovered that probably our Academic World Quest students are going to be the only ones there that actually have a local connection to Oman. Okay, so let's think where that comes from. I discovered in, as I was getting um, uh, ready to introduce uh, Brian and Linda, that Linda Lindquist Bishop has been helping to train young Omani women in competitive sailing at the invitation of the Sultan of Oman since 2011. So, so it's something that seems to only happen in Traverse City, and it's, it's truly amazing. So thank you all uh, so much, and uh, I want you to know that all of the money raised tonight is going to fund their travel to uh, Washington, D.C. So thank you very much. All right, you'll see them at the end. Mm -hmm. And this connection with Oman, for me, it really underscores that as our students head off to Washington, D.C., we never know where these experiences are going to lead. Perhaps some of them will decide to study international affairs in the future. Maybe they'll see an internship uh, opportunity that interests them. Maybe they'll simply meet others of all colors and backgrounds and come away with a better understanding of the world. It's all good. And it's the unlimited possibilities, and that is why IEF began this program here in Traverse City. So, I'm wondering if there are any other Academic World Quest uh, participants from this year, other students who uh, competed this year. Would you stand up? Anybody else? 
No, I know Matt Failer. Look at him. All right, Matt, you're the only one, so you stand up. We had, um, and I'm going to explain. We actually had uh, 11 area high schools uh, compete, and we're talking about Petoskey and Mancelona and Elk Rapids and Northport and, and all over. Um, and Matt happens to be part, uh, a member of the team that came in third place this year, and he's also from TC Central. So I, I don't know, TC Central, there must be something in the water, but they're definitely dominating this, this academic competition. So, and I'd also like to really recognize the advisors uh, that are working with these students and, the, and that go above and, and beyond. John Failer is here tonight. John. John is a terrific example of the caliber of teachers that we are fortunate to have in this area. He's also the advisor for the robotics competition and the team here, and he spends many, many, many hours outside of the classroom to help our students. So, and finally, I would like to recognize the volunteers that go into making the academic world quest possible. Um, we're, we're all volunteers, basically. But uh, the people who worked on it this past year, would you please stand up right now, too? I see Sandy, Ann, Dana, Robin, Brenda, anyway. If anyone else would like to be involved in next year, it's a terrific, rewarding, um, and fun thing to do. Turning to tonight's presentation, uh, when I spoke earlier about IEF wanting to encourage a sense of unlimited possibilities for our students, they really couldn't find better role models than Brian and Linda. Linda made history in 1995 as a member of America 3, the first all-women's team to compete in the America's Cup. She then became publisher of Yachting Magazine, was honored by Lifetime Television in 1997 as one of the top 100 women of the century, and continued to win world championships in sailing. While that would have been enough for many people, Linda went on to create her own startup company dedicated to helping women succeed in today's world. It's through this nonprofit that she got involved with helping the Omani women. And she continues today to work tirelessly to change perceptions of what women can do. Now, Brian just retired as a two star general in the U.S. Air Force. That's a big deal, as I'm sure you know. Fewer than 0.5% of commissioned officers make it to the top three ranks. He has commanded at all levels, including what my husband thinks is the coolest, the Thunderbirds. Um, as well as commanding uh, bases in Saudi Arabia and Iraq. For our purposes here tonight, he served three tours of duty in Korea, the first in 1988, the second in 2005, and the last in 2011 to 13, where he was Deputy Chief of Staff to the UN Command and to US Forces Korea. Since we're out of school, I think we have to ask the question, what did they do for education to achieve all of this, all right? Brian got a Bachelor of Science degree in Aeronautical Engineering from the Air Force Academy, and later he got an MBA at Oklahoma City University. Now, Linda followed a less traditional path. She received an undergraduate degree in Philosophy, Ethics, and Religious Studies. Now, as a parent of a student right now at a liberal arts college, which I don't know what she's going to study, I find that really reassuring. <laughs> So for both of them, formal education was simply the beginning to a lifetime of learning about the world, and we are so fortunate to have them here tonight. And without further ado, I'm just going to turn over the rest of the evening to Linda Lindquist Bishop and General Brian Bishop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, and congratulations to the team headed to D.C. We are so excited for you, and thank you for representing Traverse City so well. Well, I'm just going to take a few brief moments tonight and take you on a postcard tour of South Korea and our experiences and our last tour there when we were stationed at the Yongsan Army Garrison. Um, Land of the Morning Calm is a tagline for South Korea. Um, so I'll start, this was Brian's office at USFK, the UNC headquarters. It was called the White House. Behind it is the Seoul Tower, which I'll show you a picture of. 
Uh, this is our home. Uh, the Falcon House is the Air Force Senior Officer House on base. And the reason I'm showing this uh, group of photos is to show you how close we are to downtown Seoul. I equate where we are at Yongsan with the equivalent of living in Central Park in Manhattan. So it's really wonderful to leave any gate and you're right downtown Seoul. Um, Brian will speak about his duties as head of the United Nations Command. And one thing that was our duty, but also a great privilege, was to entertain and engage with the Ambassador Corps and Foreign Servants Corps. So this is entertaining in our home. And we just met fascinating people that had incredible careers um, uh, in these events. Um, I was over there uh, one of my long periods in February, and February is Super Bowl time, so we had fun watching the Super Bowl, but uh, two notes on that. One, it happens at 8 in the morning in South Korea, so we had a Super Bowl brunch. And the other is on the Air Force, or rather the Armed Forces Network, which is how all the military gets our U.S. TV programs around the world. Uh, we're lucky to get the shows, but we don't get the commercials. So. As you were watching the puppies and the Clydesdales, we were watching the Super Bowl with the cape that was made on base at Yongsan. Um, many mornings I was able to hike uh, pre-dawn with a group of gals from the base and we'd hike all the way up to the space, the um, Seoul Tower and it was just beautiful. Quite a landmark in Seoul. When Brian wasn't uh, attending to his official duties, he was often doing other things contributing on base and in the city, and this is an example of that as he was speaking to the Boy Scouts one day on base. For me, I had a great, rich opportunity to engage with the other senior spouses from all over the world, and we shopped and we traveled and we got to know each other, and it was a very, very rewarding opportunity for me. Now, for those of you who know Brian, he likes flying fast, preferably upside down or in circles, but he didn't have an airplane in Korea. However, it didn't stop him from flying. He just strapped a kite to his back and started jumping off mountains. So he uh, attained a second certification level of paragliding, and I was very happy to go up to the top in the truck and go back down to the bottom in the truck. But going through these pictures, I came across this little series, and I thought, hmm, you know, he's doing a great job packing that all up neat and tidy. There might be some more things he might be good at around the house now that he's home. So the Han River is the large river that goes down the, uh, through the middle of Seoul. Let's think of the Mississippi. This is a river that hadn't been developed until very recently along the sides, and now they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars developing the parkways, concert venues. You can see here a yacht club, sailing club, and restaurants, and even the swan paddle boats. So we really enjoyed biking up and down um, the Han River. The flower markets are just spectacular. Um, just one of my favorite stops on the shopping tour. And the hanbok is the traditional Korean dress. And now this is worn uh, primarily at Korean weddings or very special occasions, graduations, and people will come to these custom hanbok tailors and have their hanboks made for the occasion. Um, Mr. Lim and Mr. O um, are near and dear to the military's heart over in Korea. There are two tailors that are well known and they make uniforms as well as coats and anything else that might we may want to bring back to the state. So they've been around for decades and part of the military fabric. This is actually the only Starbucks in the world that Starbucks isn't written in English. Even when we were in the Forbidden Palace in Beijing, the Starbucks in the, for, or in the Forbidden City um, was written in English. This is written in Hangul, and it's in the shopping district, Itiwan. I was fascinated with the Seoul Fish Market. It is massive, and there are things in there that look like they belong in an Indiana Jones movie more than in a place you'd go to eat. But it was fascinating, and we really enjoyed our time walking up and down the aisle. I do think we probably had salmon and shrimp when we did our tasting, though. 
Um, we did take a weekend and head up to Pyeongchang, which will be the site of the 2018 Winter Olympics. And as you'll see in the top left corner here, Brian and I have uh, different ideas on what's the best grip on a bobsled. But I don't think either one of us will be um, uh, having to worry about that since we won't be there. And for those of you from Leland, you'll recognize our, our uh, hello Leland Yacht Club Burgie. So this was another trip on a weekend. We went up to a small fishing village resort area on the northeast side of South Korea, very close to the border of North Korea. And in this quaint fishing village, we climbed up the stairway here, and right here was this guard tower. And it really brought home how close we were to North Korea. Then we looked out and we could see the South Korean Navy patrolling the waters. And then, as we stood at that guard tower, we looked through the trees and looked at our hotel. Well, the next morning I did what I always do when I'm in a waterfront area, and I got up to go down to the beach for a sunrise beach walk, only to find that I couldn't have access because of the uh, fence that was protecting us. This was the tower we'd seen the day before, and this one up here was even closer to our hotel. So. The level of living is very normal, but it's also within a constant state of vigilance. Um, I wanted to show you this because I'm completely fascinated by this harbor construction. I call them tax, like the picking up the tax you play with. And you'll see how big these are. And I really wonder how they move these things around. Um, but a lot of fun. Um, so, as I finish up here, I just wanted to share a few um, glimpses of the DMZ from my perspective. I was fortunate enough to go up with a group of senior uh, officer spouses um, before we even got to the DMZ. As you can see, there's guard shacks and razor wires along the Han River, only 10, 15 miles outside of northern Seoul. This is the Bridge of No Return. Uh, which Brian will speak of, and this is a South Korean um, security area officer, and these white stakes are actually the real demarcation between North and South Korea. Um, we did feel safe. We had a very significant security de detail with us, and this left a very big impression on me. This building is the, uh, think of it as a negotiating building between North and South Korea. This line, this cement line, is the line. And as you can see here on the table in the building, these microphones are the real DMZ. They are the demarcation. The south sits here, the north sits here, and with interpreters they talk. This shows I'm standing in North and South Korea. And so that's where the full me, but standing at this point. So very humbling and rather awe-inspiring to be in that moment. Um, this is actually the communication building. This, these buildings are North Korea. So if the, um, our side wants to talk to the people over in this building, they use this really modern technology. If they don't answer, which they often don't, this is part of their propaganda, then our security forces take this modern um, object and walk right up to the ear of the North Korean soldier standing on the line and start blasting in hopes of um, gaining some communication. This was a very significant photo for me. We were not allowed to take pictures facing North Korea because they would then use that as accusations that we were spying on their country and they would start to spin that of propaganda. So I actually took pictures of our people, but this is the North Korean building and a North Korean soldier in the reflection of our building. And then this is um, Elsa. She's up at the Swiss camp. Brian will speak about this um, area. And she was sculpted with the hope that um, of this artist that she would be able to fly food. You can see her wings are made of knives, forks, and spoons, and that she would be able to fly food over the border to the starving people in North Korea. And two years ago, I'll end with this slide, two years ago, um, Blaine Harden came uh, to the National Writers Series. 
I was privileged enough to have lunch with him. It was actually at the time Brian was in North Korea. Um, Several of you have read this book. I highly recommend it. It's a bit of a difficult content read, but important and gives you an insight to the real mind-bending horrors of the gulags that exist as we stand here today in North Korea. Uh, This young man is the only person we know of that was actually born in the gulag, uh, Camp 14 being the most severe, and escaped. And it's not all a rosy picture. So I encourage you to read that book. At lunch, Blaine shared a couple points that really stuck home with me. One is that this is the first gulag system, the North Korean system with multiple gulags, to actually survive more than five years the life of the dictator that created them, whether it was Hitler or Stalin or Pol Pot. They're on their third, going on their fourth generation. Um, That after the book came out, the aerial satellite photos show that Camp 14 had been fortified and even made larger. Um, The World Health Organization has actually determined that uh, for every 50 miles you go outside of Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea, the people get shorter and smaller due to malnutrition. Um, People wonder about the Chinese border and that relation there. It's not only an economic trade, but there are trillions of dollars, they claim, of precious metals, uh, technology metals in the mountains of North Korea. And we often hear the question, well, why don't these people revolt? Why isn't there an Arab Spring over there? Well, the great leader and his father have spent decades telling the people that they must sacrifice and their army must be strong because the great leader must protect them from us because we will come in as we did in the 50s and carpet bomb their country and kill all of them. So the propaganda is real and it's believed by their people. So with that, I'm going to thank you for letting me take you on a quick tour and I'm going to bring up Major General Retired Brian T. Bishop, who was a great guy. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you all for, for being here. I really appreciate it. And I know the students will as well. I think this is a really fantastic thing that Traverse City is going to Washington, D.C. Uh, the Academic World Quest, congratulations to the students. That really says a lot for your, your desire to learn more about the world. Engineering and politics, I'm not sure those mix very well, but I have more power to you. That's, that's absolutely fantastic. I wish I could be smart enough to, to combine those two together. Um, this is a briefing that I have given, and it is, I've taken bits and pieces of a briefing that I gave probably 800 times in the two years that I was there on my last tour. And what it was typically for was for VIPs that would come in, other distinguished visitors that would come in, and what we tried to do is give them an update on what was going on with respect to the two Koreas. Um, I've focused on it, I've updated it a little bit, I've changed some of the things. I would ask you that the numbers in it, when you start talking GDP numbers, Population, some of that. Those were current as of 2013. I wasn't able to update all of them. So don't hold me to the numbers today, please. But they're ballpark. They're going to be about the right uh, right place. Um, It was a lot of fun to give this briefing. It was a lot of fun to talk about the two Koreas. Uh, What I will tell you is that I am not a Korea expert. I am a guy who got to spend three tours in Korea. I didn't study about Korea, but I did get to command this base right here. This is Kunsan Air Base. I'm in this airplane right there. The runway, is the, the main runway is out here next to the ocean, cross runway, which is really a taxiway, and you can see the hardened aircraft shelters for the F-16s are all in that big S-turn. The main part of the base is right over here where we had roughly 3,000 airmen living there, and they were there without their families because it was what we called a remote tour. Now I need to ask tonight, do we have any Korean War veterans here tonight? Would you please stand or raise your hand? if you can. Thank you for serving. One of the things I hope to accomplish, and some of you may have been at Kunsan, it was called K-19 at the time, but one of the things I hope to accomplish is to show you how the South Korean people have taken their nation to a completely different level, and to make you very proud that what you did over there and the service that you gave our country over there 
was absolutely worth it. Now, Linda, during this tour, was not able to come over and stay with me. She was able to come over and visit with me a couple times. And so uh, when she came over, we were able to set up a little tour for her. And so she got to get out on the base and uh, have a little fun. <laughs> said, she's probably the only one with stiletto boots that has shot in a 50 caliber. <laughs> Woo! Woo nice. On my last tour, this is uh, me standing right at the bridge of no return, right next to the sign that says military demarcation line. And I will tell you that every time I went to the DMZ, it was a very humbling experience. I usually, because of my duties under United Nations Command, which I'll talk about, I probably averaged over the two years a day or two a week in the DMZ. Sometimes I was there all five days, escorting the Prime Minister of Denmark, escorting the President of Colombia, uh, but it was really an honor and a privilege to go up there and serve and, see, and stand alongside our, our young men and women who are serving up in the DMZ. So, as with any good military officer, I can't put a sentence together without about 14 acronyms in it. So what I'm going to try to do is my absolute very best to not use acronyms tonight, but if I throw some out there, I want to go through them very, very quickly to kind of keep you on the line. ROK is the Republic of Korea. That is equal to South Korea. So I will say Republic of Korea, South Korea. I will use those interchangeably. They mean the same thing. Republic of Korea is their, is their uh, actual official name, and they, they, they actually like to be called the Republic of Korea. DPRK, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, North Korea. I will use DPRK and North Korea interchangeably sometimes, uh, and I apologize for that. United Nations Command. United Nations Command, or UNC, was the command that was established by the United Nations after the Korean War broke out. It's the only command that the United Nations has established that was led by, a, by the United States or led by any other country. If you think about it, the United Nations was so new, and they didn't have a command structure like they do now to have UN forces under a United Nations commander. It is still active today because we're still under an armistice, and that was one of my primary roles was working in, with United Nations Command. Uh, United States Forces Korea is the command that in the headquarters that, that oversees all of the U.S. forces that are in Korea. So any forces that are already stationed there of the 28,500 that are there now, or any other forces that would come into Korea based on a contingency or, or some training or whatever, the USFK is the command that oversees that. Combined Forces Command, that is a combined command between U.S. forces and Korean forces. In fact, the four-star general who is in charge of United States Forces Korea is also in charge of United Nations Command, is also in charge of Combined Forces Command. He has three hats, and let me tell you, he stays very busy under all three of those hats. The demilitarized zone, the DMZ, that is kind of a misnomer, because it's actually probably the most militarized zone in the world. <laughs> UNCMAC. United Nations Command Military Armistice Commission. That is a commission that was put together by the armistice to oversee uh, activities that, went on, that go on in the DMZ to maintain the separation of forces and to settle disputes. And I'll talk about that a little bit more as I get into it, but realize the armistice was really only supposed to be in place for about two weeks, and then we were going to have a peace treaty. We're almost 63, 63 years later, and we still have not got a peace treaty. The MDL is the military demarcation line. Those are those little white posts that Linda showed you. I'll show you a little bit more about those while we're out in the briefing here. In NNSC, the Neutral Nations Supervisory Commission. On our side, it's Sweden and Switzerland. On the north, it's Czechoslovakia, or the Czech Republic, and I'm sorry, Czechoslovakia and Poland. I'll talk a little bit about why those two nations are no longer doing the duties that they were up there. So, very quickly, in 1950, our Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, made a statement about how far the United States would go into the Pacific to defend nations that we were considered allies. That line came short of South Korea. It was not, did not include South Korea. So on the 25th of June, 1950, North Korea invaded South Korea, and they rapidly pushed us down in what we call the Pusan peri uh, perimeter, right here where we were just barely able to hang on and hold them from taking the entire country. We then, through the brilliance of MacArthur and some of his planners, had the uh, 
Inchon landing here, an amphibious landing, and if you get up there and you land at Inchon and you see how far out the tides go, I mean, you got miles and miles and miles of just mud when the tides are out. It was a magnificent feat for our forces to go in there with the Inchon landing. We cut off the North Korean supply and then we started marching forward. China looks at this and says, ooh, I don't like the way the United States is pushing forward through, North, through the Koreas that way. So China decides to get involved. And they push us back and we essentially stabilize along this dotted line right there, which is now what we call the, the military demarcation line. These are the United Nations Security Council resolutions that were passed immediately following the invasion. The most important one right now for us is that this one right here on 7 July 1950 established the United Nations Command, comprised of roughly 22 nations that provided uh, combat forces and medical forces, 53 apply, uh, applied, uh, uh, brought in other assets. Of those tw original 22, these are the nations that are still participating in United Nations Command. And as Linda said, those are the ambassadors that I got to deal with on a, on a very uh, personal basis because they were very much involved with United Nations Command and their countries were very much involved with what was going on. In fact, I was able to take a tour to three or four of their countries one summer and talk to the equivalent of their joint staff about what was going on in the Koreas. So here we have the armistice, or the agreement. These articles and paragraphs, until we get a mutually acceptable amendments and additions or by provision in an appropriate agreement for a period settlement at political level between both sides. We thought it was going to be two weeks. July 27th, 1953. And if you look at it, it's signed by Kim Il-sung, who was leading North Korea, signed by Kang Tae-wa, who is the commander of the Chinese People Volunteer Army, and General Mark Clark, who was the commander-in-chief of the United Nations Command. Anyone see a signatory that they thought should be on that document? How about South Korea? Hence, one of the very difficult and sticky navigating things that you got to work through when you're working through armistice relations. South Korea feels like they should be able to do what they want to do inside the DMZ. But when you go into the documents of this, and this is only about 14 pages long. I had a, a little copy that I carry in my pocket with me so I could reference it if I need to. South Korea thinks that they should be able to do whatever they want to on inside the DMZ. But the DMZ, the document, the armistice document, actually says you cannot have certain things in there. You can have sidearms, you can have long rifles, but you can't have tanks, and you can't have artillery. And so one of my jobs was to go into the, into the DMZ and make sure that the South Koreans didn't have that. Now, do you think the North Koreans play by the same rules? Not so much. So the armistice set up... This line, this is kind of where the, the fight stagnated for almost two years. And what the armistice did was, it said, the military commanders of the forces on either side of this line will march out to a mutually agreeable point that is halfway between their, their two front lines. They will then drive a stake into the ground. There are 1,292 stakes out there. And then they are supposed to back away two kilometers on each side. If you notice how close Seoul is to the DMZ, this is a, just about 60 miles. And this next picture I'm going to take you is to this portion of the DMZ right here. So this is Panmunjom, and these are the blue buildings that Linda just showed you. Right here is the, I'm sorry, right here is the Panmun Gak, and that is, the, that is the building that the North Korean soldiers typically stage out of. That's the building that we communicate to North Korea when we pick up the phone, and nine times out of ten they don't pick up the phone on the other side. Um, this group right here, that's the Neutral Nations Supervisory Commission camp. So the Swedish and Swiss officers that are on the south side as a neutral nation overseeing what goes on into the DMZ actually live that close. And I'll tell you, I went up one night and about off the map to the right down here is where the U.S. force uh, military installation is. I went up there and uh, spent Thanksgiving with the boys and, and served them Thanksgiving dinner the night prior. I spent with my friends, the Swiss and Swedes, up here. And let me tell you, it's kind of an eerie feeling when it gets dark, knowing that you're that close to, to the North Koreans. And you will have, they will have North Korean patrols go right along this demarcation line right here. This right here is, op, is uh, observation point, point three, and it is the furthest north into North Korea that we get into. 
This observation right here is the bridge of no return. And about right there, there was a tree that was in, in the blinding, uh, in, uh, that would uh, obstruct a view from OP3 to the OP down here where we had US forces. I'll talk a little bit about the axe murders and Operation Paul Bunyan in a slide or two. But that's, that's where this was. The Operation Paul Bunyan and the axe murders happened right there. And the reason that the, they ended up taking the tree down because we couldn't see the, the uh, observation post there. So this is what the DMR, this is what the DMZ, the demarcation line looks like. You've got a fence essentially down the whole line. You can tell this side is North Korea because there's no trees. There's no trees there because the North Koreans have been so hungry for so long that they've actually cut down almost all the trees in their country and eaten the bark and they use the bark and they boil it down for tea. It's pretty stark about some of the things that are going on up in that country. UNCMAC, like I said, is to supervise the implementation of the armistice and settle any violations, which is a really important thing. We'd go up and see suspected violations and I'd have to go up and kind of adjudicate things and convince the South Koreans to please bring your artillery outside of the DMZ. You're not supposed to do that. Here are some provocations that the North Koreans have done over the years. And I'm just, I just picked out some of the major ones. This ship was sunk. I'll talk more about the sinking of the Chonan, which happened just shortly before I got there, but I think it was a major turning point in current North Korean South Korean relations. This right here, this is the tree that our US Army guys were trimming. The North Koreans came across with axes and killed them. And shortly after that, we had the most well-protected tree removal that you could ever see in the history of the world. We had B-52s airborne, we had fighters airborne, we had probably had two or three battalions of army forces, we had artillery down there to go take that tree down because we weren't exactly sure what the North Koreans were gonna do. So, why is this region of the world important? Why should we care? Here's some numbers right here. 74, or $742 billion in annual trade with the United States, 25% of US trade goes there, 19% of world trade comes through here, Seoul is closer to Beijing than it is to China. North Korea, fourth largest military, nuclear capable, ju nuclear capable, just came out in open press that we believe that they were able to put a nuclear weapon on top of one of their ICBMs. That just came out about a week ago. People's Republic of China, second largest military, largest, uh, second largest economy, largest military nuclear power. Republic of Korea, 49 million people, call it 50 million people. 12th largest economy, 6th largest military. Taiwan, Japan. It's very important. It is a very important part of the world. The amount of trade that goes through this part of the world is staggering. So if something were to happen, if we were to have another Korean War, it would absolutely affect the world economy as we know it today. As a matter of scope, I'd like to point out that from about here in Japan, all the way down to about in here where it's down to Okinawa, that is longer than the coastline of the east coast of the United States. That just gives you a sense of scale of the scope of how large the Pacific is. So, that's Korea, Seoul in 1950. That's roughly the same picture taken from roughly the same place in 2013. This, to me, tells you what two nations can do and the choices they make when given the same conditions. Both nations were decimated after the war. And yet North Korea stayed, chose to stay in a dictatorial type of environment and government. South Korea went to democratic principles, open market economy, and this is the kind of thing that it, it developed. It is the most wired, the most connected country in the world. The GDP of South Korea is still going up. Even in 2008 when we had the world recession, the, the economy of South Korea continued to rise. They hosted the 1988 Olympics, and like, they said, like Linda said, they're getting ready to host the 2018 Olympics. Phenomenal growth. Even the three times that I went there, when I was there my first time in 1988, to my second time in 2005, to my last time in 2011, the difference in the economy and the difference in change was unbelievable. Hyundai used to, in, in, in 1988, Hyundai and Kia used to be junk cars. Hyundai is a very highly sought after car now. In fact, the Hyundai Equus, which is like the Toyota Lexus version, 
The Equus is the um, uh, luxury version of the Hyundai. It is one of the most sought after luxury cars, and let me tell you, it rides really, really nice. Here's some contrast between North and South Korea. Look here, smartphones, zero. Flat screen TV, zero. Paved roads, only less than 1,000 kilometers of paved roads in North Korea. Look at this in South Korea. By the way, this was a huge planning factor for us in the military because of the weight of many of our uh, vehicles. We were really worried that the roads were going to cave in and we wouldn't be able to advance where we needed to. So it was a huge planning factor in trying to figure that out. But I think this is the biggest thing right here, the biggest picture right there. That's Pyongyang. That's where all the elite leave, that's where the regime, regime leaves, that's where all the money is, that's where everything goes to. That's where everything that you see on the news is in Pyongyang. And then you look out in the rest of the parts of the country and it's desolate. It's exactly what these, the two decisions were made between the two Koreas. This big white blob right here, that's Seoul. That's the greater Seoul metropolitan area has 10 million, I'm sorry, Seoul City itself has 10 million people in it. The greater Seoul metropolitan area has 24 million, and there's roughly 50 million people in all of South Korea. There's 24 million people in all of North Korea. Just the contrast between the two countries. So, we're over there in 2011, December-ish, and um, CNN comes up and says, we're going to have a major announcement from North Korea at noon North Korea time. Wow, this is going to be cool. What, wonder what that means. And sure enough, she, the young lady comes out on North Korean statewide TV and says, Kim Jong-il has died and he has been, uh, success, su succession is to his son, Kim Jong-un. Well, when you start digging into it and you, find, and you really find out what happened, Kim Jong-il died three days earlier. Nobody knew about it. Not even the Chinese. So what does that tell you about the relationship between North Korea and the Chinese? I mean, many people just say, well, China should just go in there and fix it. And China should put pressure on them to stop doing all the things that they're doing. Think about the relationship between North Korea and the Chinese if the North Korea didn't even tell the Chinese that Kim Jong-il died. This was a chart that we used in trying to understand when he was fully succeeded in taking power and what was going on in the government. If you look at some of these guys, I mean, he's 61, he's 62, 74. This is his uncle, 65. This is his aunt, 65. He's 72. That's his wife. She came on the scene from nowhere. We didn't, we, we didn't see that one at all. Um, well, he took over at 29. What do you think he thinks about all these old people around him? You know, his whole, the only reason he exists is to keep the regime in power. And so what is he trying to do? What is he, what is he gonna, when is he going to reach down and start bringing in people his own age into these leadership positions? Then what happens to all of these people? These are all questions we were trying to figure out. We had, didn't have answers to any of them. But what I will tell you is that he's dead. He's probably dead. These three guys are probably dead. Uh, she died because of medical reasons. His wife came on the scene, and we never knew that, we didn't even know who she was when she first showed up. So when we talk about the hermit kingdom a little bit, think about a hermit living under a bridge being withdrawn from the entire world. That's a lot what North Korea is like. We had absolutely no clue some of the stuff that was going on, and you know all these little symbols on here, we were trying to figure out who was coming into power, who was coming out of power, who, is, who were his closest advisors, who, who was he pushing out, was he going to bring new people in, was it, you know, and trying to make predictions on whether this was going to be a collapse or whether they were just going to continue on with the regimes the way they have over the last three generations. And it appears that that's what they're doing. North Korean military, their conventional military. 1.1 million forces, 4,000 tanks, world's largest artillery, 13,000 systems, 11,000 plus underground facilities. Underground facilities large enough to house this submarine and back it into an underground facility on the ocean so we couldn't see what they were doing with it. Underground facilities large enough that where they could put entire uh, wings of airplanes and runways underground and hide it from us. There's a line right here that we call the Pyongyang Wonsan Line. And the reason this is painted kind of a darker shade of red than everything up here 
is because about three quarters of their artillery tubes are down in this part. And let me tell you, they're not pointing north. They're pointing south. Which means they could very easily attack with little to no evidence. In fact, there were artillery tubes so that within less than a minute, if North Korea wanted to launch an artillery piece, it would land in Seoul and we would have no notice and no warning of it at all. And yet the people in Seoul, South Korea, live life every day just like you'd see people walking around in Shanghai or in New York City. This is their asymmetric threat. World's second largest chem bio or chemical weapons stockpile. I read something, and I think it's probably true, that they're no, they're no longer the second largest, they are now the largest. Once we got rid of all the chemical weapons in Syria, arguably North Korea is now the largest. Special Ops Forces, 60,000 plus, 130,000 Special Ops-like forces. Nuclear capable, no longer question marks there. They've demonstrated that they, can, that they can detonate a nuclear weapon. And now in open press, South Korea has acknowledged that they, we believe that they can put a nuclear weapon on a missile. Probably this one right here, one of the short range ones. These are their main ICBMs. This one right here, the Taepodong 2, is really problematic for the United States. Because you see this range ring right here, it includes North Korea to the United States, it includes all of the United States. So do I think that they are going to put a nuclear weapon on an ICBM and launch it to Washington DC or New York City? No. However, if Kim Jong-un thinks that that will keep him in power, he just might. So it's something that we've got to remember that we've got to take and keep into the calculus when we're dealing with North Korea. And uh, I think just when they, they just had a, it was either another nuclear test or a missile, they just had a missile launch, that's what it was. And shortly after that, South Korea came out and said that's when they thought that they could put nuclear weapons on a uh, missile. Immediately after that, this propaganda clip came out from North Korean TV. So, how many remember the Cold War propaganda films that Russia did? Doesn't it look a lot like that? I mean, that's, what you, that's the kind of thinking that's going on. I, I mean, uh, I was, there's a new book out, um, I think it's something in, to live, a young lady just wrote it. She's a North Korean defector, came out through China. She says, you know, she, she was told and actually believed that Kim Jong-il could read their minds. That's the amount of propaganda that's going on. And so when you hear things in the press like North Korea is going to burn Seoul into a sea of fire, I would argue that that is a lot more towards their internal audience in North Korea than it is necessarily to the external audience. Now, they are trying to send a signal to the United States. They're trying to send a signal to the world, absolutely. But there is a large internal audience that I'm not sure we take into account some of the times when we hear some of the things that are going on in the press. These are some of the provocations that happened in and around the time that I was there in my last tour. First, on March 26, 2011, shortly, about a year before I got there, they sunk the Chonan. The Chonan was a, a vessel, a South Korean vessel, patrolling out 
in the northern parts of the, of the Yellow Sea out there. Um, North Korea absolutely denies that they did anything, and yet we had a multinational investigation. They found this North Korean torpedo on the floor of the ocean. When they looked at the Chonan, and you saw the picture of it on shore on one an earlier slide, that is there as a memorial and as a monument to the, to the 46 RK soldiers who died, or uh, sailors who died on it. When you go in and you look at the hull, it did not blow out. It blew in. And when you look at gas, bubble gas jet technology for torpedoes, what it does is a torpedo is not supposed to hit the boat. It's supposed to explode underneath it, which sends up a big bubble, which causes the boat to go up into the, in the air, and then comes crashing down and breaks the keel of the hull. That's exactly what happened in this case. Shortly after that, 21st of November 2010, highly enriched uranium program. We had a scientist go to North Korea. He was given a tour. He was specifically brought into a room that he was not able, they were never allowed people to go into before. He saw some centrifuges there, came back and reported that the only thing that those centrifuges could be used for was for highly enriched uranium. In other words, North Korea was subtly boasting that they would have a highly enriched uranium program and that they were working on a nuclear program. Two days later, the shelling at Waipido. Young Pyong, uh, Young Pyong Do, Do means island. So this island is very close to North Korea, out east, uh, I'm sorry, out west of Seoul, out in the Yellow Sea. It's a very small island. It has some, uh, uh, a small number of South Koreans on it, primarily fishermen. There is a, a contingent of South Korean soldiers out there. We were doing, they were doing a live fire exercise, so they were shooting their artillery, but they were shooting it south and west into the Yellow Sea, away from North Korea. North Korea knew exactly when they were going to stop, because as soon as they stopped and, and ran out of ammunition for the live fire exercise, North Korea started shelling the island. And I think the South Koreans did a pretty daggum good job by getting their artillery tubes turned around, going back to the bunker, getting some artillery, and shooting back into North Korea. They did that in all of it about 15 minutes, which is a pretty good uh, reaction, in my opinion. But what happened was, is they lost some lives, some South Korean lives and some soldiers' lives on this island. This right here was a cell phone video of that. That, I think is a single incident which really galvanized the South Korean people to want to react and want to, want to respond primarily to North Korean provocations. And so while we were there, the responses that South Korea wanted to make, that the South Korean military wanted to make to North Korean provocations were, uh, let's just say, on the order of ridiculous. You know, if, if, we would, if, the, if North Korea had launched two artillery shells at, at South Korea, they wanted to respond with 3,000. That's kind of the scale it was. December, when I was there, they had a missile launch and was absolutely uh, condemned in the press. The United Nations Security Council uh, brought on more sanctions. And then April 12th, they did it again. And this time they launched a satellite. This particular launch failed. Subsequent to that, I think about a year ago, they did launch a satellite. I'm sorry, the second, second launch that they had while I was there, they did launch a satellite. It did make it into orbit. The satellite tumbled, so I would argue that it wasn't successful. But what we really think is going on here is they are doing ballistic missile testing and ballistic missile technology, which they are specifically banned from doing by the United Nations. And then uh, while I was there, February 12, 2013, they did have another nuclear test, uh, and we did have people over there that could try to sniff and see exactly what it was. So, here's where I tell you that I believe North Korea is completely predictable, and all of you think North Korea is completely unpredictable. I will tell you that they follow a cycle, and it is very predictable how they're going to go through that cycle. They antagonize, they provoke, they appease, and they demand concessions. They keep following this cycle around and around the outside. And the cycle is important, not because that's what they do, I think, but because of all of this asymmetric stuff that's coming up and growing under, in the middle of this slide in this model here. While everyone in the world is watching this outside piece go on, they're listening to North Korean press releases, they're listening, they're listening to launch missiles, they're listening to doing other things and watch them do that. North Korea continues to slowly build their nuclear program, their ballistic missile program. They proliferate uh, nuclear uh, technologies to other, other countries. I believe that is the more important piece out of this slide. 
All that goes on seemingly under the radar because the diplomatic world, the rest of the world is watching the external stuff that is going on with respect to North Korea. These are the three commands that I worked under. Actually, I worked on the two on the, on the far sides under United Nations Command, United States Forces Korea. These are some of the things that we were supposed to do. You can take a care, read through those. So under USFK, some of the, many of the things we did was take care of the families, non-combatant evacuation operation. That's when the ambassador says, it's time to leave Korea. Now think about this. Do you think the US ambassador to South Korea is ever going to tell the, I don't know how many thousands of Americans that are there, because it's not just the military. Ford is there, IBM's there. You, you pick a, com a US company, it's there. As soon as the ambassador says it's time to get the Americans out of South Korea and declares a non-combatant evacuation operation, that simply means now we can US, 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 use US government funds to get people out. What does that say about his diplomatic skills? It says he failed. What is that gonna do to the world economy when the US starts pulling out of South Korea? If Denmark pulls out, it's probably not a big deal. If the US pulls out, it's a big deal. And so we would practice non-combatant evacuation operations, but the reality is we probably were never going to execute one. Taking care of service member discipline, yes, unfortunately, service members are people too, and sometimes these young soldiers uh, get out, they do things that they're not supposed to, and unfortunately, that blows up in the press more often than not because of who we are, because we are the United States. It just is what it is. Under United Nations Command, watching miscalculations and you know, crisis mitigation, ooh, Christmas trees. I wonder what that means. So along the DMZ, these uh, South Korean uh, churches wanted to put three very large Christmas trees, all lit up and just, you know, wonderful. Don't you think that's a little provocative to the North Koreans? Maybe just a tiny bit? So yes, we dealt with Christmas trees on the DMZ. So this is, uh, these are the nations like we talked about that are still part of the United Nations Command. These are the ambassadors standing right along the DMZ there. These are the blue buildings where we do most of the negotiations. That is the Panmun Gak right there. North Korean soldiers typically stand right up there. In fact, if you watch right here, you can't see it in this picture, but there's a window there. And there's always a guy with binoculars there anytime US forces are down there. So I talked about the Neutral Nations Supervisory Commission. It, it started originally with four nations, Sweden, Switzerland, Poland, and Czechoslovakia. Poland and Czechoslovakia were on the side of the north, Sweden and Switzerland were on the side of the south. And they were there as neutral nations to oversee what went along in the DMZ. Well, when Czechoslovakia became the Czech Republic, North Korea argued they were no longer Czechoslovakia, so kicked them out. So now Poland is in North Korea by themselves, and the power and water kept going out to the Polish camp on the north side of the border. So Poland said, we're done, we're out. But Poland still comes back and we meet with them about twice a year, and they come back and, and do what they can from the monitoring of the North that they can, which really isn't much. But they are still committed to the armistice, they're still committed to the, to the principles of the armistice, so they come back and meet with us on, a, like I said, about a semi-annual basis. Republic of Korea military, I would tell you it is very, very, very capable. Extremely capable. They've got some issues, they've got some command and control things. There's a, a thing called operational command transfer, which we are trying to transfer operational command of the ground fight to the Republic of Korea. Uh, they want it, but then we just pushed it off a little bit further. We would like to transfer to them. They feel they're not quite ready, but I will tell you, having exercised with them starting in 1988, having done it again with them in 2005, they're extremely capable military and they can hold their own. And uh, there is no, absolutely no way that North Korea is gonna come rolling down over the top of them. Very, very quickly, this picture, what I want to draw your attention to is up here. This picture shows all the different mil US military installations across the Republic of Korea. And we're moving to gathering them up and putting them in more central locations. Kunsan right here is the base that I uh, commanded. Seoul is right here. We're moving a lot of the forces up north by the DMZ down here to a place called Camp Humphreys. Osan Air Base is another US air base there. But look at this. It's costing about $10.7 billion, and look who's funded most of it. The Republic of Korea wants us there. 
and they're willing to put their money on the line to do it. Uh, they, want 20, they want more than 28,500 soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines and coasties there. But they are very appreciative of what the U.S. has done, and they show it by going to their pocketbook right there. So very briefly, I, I think that it is an incredibly important part of the world. I think we cannot just give it up. Uh, I will tell you that we have a great relationship with the Republic of Korea military. We have a great relationship with them, I think, also diplomatically, although sometimes it doesn't come out uh, in the press. But I think it is an incredibly important part of the world economy, and we need to be there. So with that, I'd like to open up briefly for any questions that you may have. Uh, General, sir. I was in Berlin when the wall went up, so I'm familiar with the wall we had in Berlin. Um, how long, I read a while back, how long the DMZ is and how wide it is. It's quite astounding to me. Yeah, the DMZ is 242 kilometers long. It's four kilometers wide. Tell uh, us in miles. And miles. <laughs> 130-ish miles long and about 2.4 miles wide, okay? How effective are the sanctions against North Korea? So that's a great question because the sanctions, as in any country for the most part, the sanctions impact the, the normal populace. They don't impact the regime very much at all. I mean. Kim Jong-un is very happy to go around and do the things that he wants to do. He's got all the money he wants. You know, the, the, the militaries themselves are um, corrupt. The senior military officers are corrupt. They're taking money. Uh, they use their, their, I would tell you that their military is the biggest jobs program that they got in North Korea because they use the soldiers to, to harvest and plant the crops. They have to. They have to. Otherwise, they'd be bored. You don't want bored soldiers. Um, so they use the soldiers to do a lot of the, the menial laborers and types of things. And then they, the, the, of course, by doing that, then the army gets a certain portion of the crop. Then the army turns around and sells that back to the people. Well, now they take that money. You know, it's just this corrupt whole piece that is just absolutely phenomenal. Um, I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> oh, thank you. I don't, I don't see them effective on the people that we want them to be effective on. On the slide where you saw Kim Jong-un in the middle, we had UN, uh, UN, United Nations Security Council resolutions people identified who were corrupt and who were taking money and who were doing things that we were trying to target. It's really hard to target those people because they are off doing things you know, because of the corruptness of the government. It's just really, really hard. So unfortunately what happens is you end up having droughts, you have famines, you have other things that go on and the, and the normal average person uh, is barely able to s exist. I was talking to one of the ambassadors who went up there. He was dual accredited in, in South Korea and North Korea. And he was able to actually get out of Pyongyang and go see um, some farmers. And he went and talked to this one family. He walked in. He saw this woman. She was pregnant. She was obviously lactating. You know, he said, well, what do you feed your family? And she said, well, you know, I have my extra rations because of my baby. And, um, you know, so I share that with my family. And he, he said, you could immediately see his handler step in, say something to her. And she said, oh, but what I really meant to say was the extra rations are for me and my baby and my family. We, su we survive on a little bit of corn and rice that we get. No, they are living hand to mouth. They are absolutely living hand to mouth. Uh, when, if you're able to read Escape from Camp 14, one of the things, you, one of the things that struck me in there was the, the gentleman that the story is about. He saw his mother and his brother as competition for food. He didn't see his mother as a loving mother. She was competition for food. And so when her and her brother, her and her brother, his brother, decided to try to escape and start planning it, he turned them in. Because that's what you do. I think there's a question back here. I've got a question. Oh, please. Yes. Um, in the beginning, you said that South Korea never signed the, the agreement. Now, if they ever did, would that mean we would have to leave? So they will never sign the armistice agreement because South Korea was represented by General Clark under United Nations command. Okay. Remember, this was an agreement between two militaries. 
This was not a diplomatic or political agreement. The armistice agreement was signed between two militaries to separate the military forces. Kim, Kim Il-sung, who was the dictator, also happened to be the leader of their military. And then the Chinese officer was also the leader of the Chinese people's voluntary military who was there. So it was a, a, an agreement between two militaries to keep them apart. The South Korean soldiers fought under United Nations command. Okay. And so there will never, what, what we want is a peace treaty between North and South Korea. Right. South Korea would sign that, yes. Now, if you said, though, that you thought it was going to last two weeks, and it's lasted 63 years, so what was South Korea supposed to do then? I mean, I'm confused. So there would have been a political negotiation. That never the happened. armistice agreement was a military to military negotiation to separate, based on a political decision to we've got to stop this fighting because we've just stagnated along what's now called the military demarcation line. There was a political decision to stop fighting, so the armies negotiated a way to stop. But politically, we never negotiated a peace treaty. Oh, okay. okay, thank you. Uh, I think we had a mic over here somewhere. Yeah, hi. Uh, so you showed some very impressive stats about uh, you know comparing the North and the South, and I was just wondering how much more powerful and capable does South Korea have to be uh, before we can sort of stop subsidizing their defense? Well, I would argue we're not subsidizing their defense, not at all. They are paying for their own defense, and, and the contribution of their GDP to their defense is significant. We do have U.S. forces there, and those U.S. forces there are to help. Um, bolster the South Koreans. Think about the message that it sends to the world when U.S. forces start pulling out of there. Politically, that sends a huge message. So I don't see that we are ever going to leave South Korea from a military standpoint. Did I misunderstand your question? Okay. Uh, thank you first for a very interesting uh, presentation. But, uh, could you talk about the role of uh, China? Uh, is there a uh, level to which they could become a a positive influence? How far could North Korea maybe push things before they'd actually step in? That's a very interesting question, and I don't think a question anyone has an answer to. Even some of the greatest academics that we had come to talk with us, I'm not sure they had a very good answer as well. Go back to the story I talked about when Kim, Kim Jong-il died and his son came into power. China didn't even know, and it happened three days ahead of time. That tells you a little bit about the influence that China has over North Korea. Now, during my time there, we saw an increasing presence of China as, as more diplomats would come into Pyongyang and visit with the North Korean leadership. And we thought that was going to be a good thing. But I just recently read in, the, in open press that China's influence has waned significantly. Uh, I think that, this is just Brian Bishop thinking here, I think that Kim Jong-un doesn't want to be told what to do. And so he is... He's very carefully trying to play his balance between how much do I let China influence us and how much do I keep them away because I'm, I'm in control of my country. Now, the, the, I think the real question here is when do we have an implosion of North Korea and we have a reunification of the two Koreas, if it's even possible? That, I have absolutely no idea. But if you think about the difficulty between East Germany and West Germany when we were unified, when they were unified, the work ethic, the work is load here is going to be tenfold, tenfold more difficult to do that because North Korea is just in such a decimated state right now. It really is. How about we do one more question and then I will stay late for people who want to come up afterwards. General, um, <coughs> over here. Uh, the North Korean military. How effective are they really, and particularly from a command and control viewpoint, once something starts? Yeah, so they are very much based on a Soviet model. Almost all of their, their conventional equipment is Soviet-based uh, technology. It is breaking. It's hard to keep up. It really looks good in a parade because it gets painted. But that doesn't necessarily mean it works really well. Uh, their command and control is very Soviet-based, very much command directed down from a central location in Pyongyang. There is not a lot of freedom of maneuver is what I'll call it, okay? Um, conventionally, I think that we will have a very easy time taking care of the North Korean military. Now, if China gets involved, that could be a different story. The, the piece that I'm really concerned about is the unconventional part, the asymmetric part. 
and what is the calculus that we need to play out and what are, what are they going to do if it looks like all hope is lost? Are they going to start throwing out chemical weapons? Probably. Are they going to start throwing out nuclear weapons? I don't know, but that would really be ugly. Okay. Let me say thank you all again very much for coming tonight. Thank you for supporting the students here. Congratulations to you guys. I will stay down front if you have any more questions. Thank you. And thank you also to Linda and to Brian. Thank you so much. What a wonderful thing.